It was Goethe who said the human mind will not be confined to any limits. Thoughts are vibrations, manifestations of energy. With our imagination, we can duplicate the outside world internally. We can then embellish it, modify it, exaggerate it, improve it. Literally, put into reality what is previously only a dream and draw into our lives what for most people will never be more than a fantasy. We can create changes in our physiology, such as influencing blood flow, muscular tension, immunological responses and auto-perceptions of pain and discomfort, and ignite the unlimited possibilities of the imagination. Wouldn't it be great if you could tap into the minds of some of the world's finest hypnotists and get answers to some of the most asked questions, the easy and the tough ones? You can. Welcome to Top Hypnotist Answer the Tough Questions. How would you define hypnosis? Well, I, I describe hypnosis to my students in any event is uh, a daydream on steroids. Uh, by definition, I, I kind of agree with the definition that uh, hypnosis is, uh, the definition of hypnosis is when we bypass critical faculty and implement selective thinking. Uh, in fact, I don't even, I prefer critical faculty bypass to the word hypnosis. I think it makes more sense because it's more in, it, it more addresses the science of hypnosis. The feelings of hypnosis are said to be very subjective. However, is there a common experience among hypnotic subjects? The, the way I describe it to patients that come into the office is simply this. I say most people, and I think it's important to clarify that not everybody, because you, you don't, it's important not to lock the person into the mindset that that's what they should experience, because there is no right or wrong way to experience hypnosis. But I generally ask people, have you... Do you enjoy the beach? And if they say yes, yeah, so you're, do you remember being on the beach at any time and you're kind of sitting back in a, in a beach chair laying on a blanket and you're not asleep and you're not awake, you're listening to the surf, there's hundreds of people maybe around you talking and you kind of hear them, but if I said to you, hey, what'd that person right next to you say? You'd go, I don't know. But if it wasn't important, I wasn't really listening. But if somebody yelled shark, you would get up and you would look because you weren't fully awake and alert, but you weren't fully asleep. That's the way uh, I describe it the, as to how most people will experience hypnosis. How is hypnosis and hypnotherapy different from psychology or cognitive behavioral therapy? Well, the most important thing goes right to the definition of hypnosis is when we bypass critical thought and implement selective thinking. And, and I think the, the most important thing is to understand the difference between thoughts, because we can have thoughts in hypnosis. If we couldn't have thoughts in hypnosis and somebody was just in some dark hole in, in the back of their mind, it, it would be impossible to do therapy with them. We do have thoughts in hypnosis, but it's critical thoughts that we want to avoid. So with... With that in mind, what, what was, give, give me that, I just want to make sure, I'm, okay, yeah, the, yeah, the, hypnosis, it's easy to hypnotize somebody and have them just in hypnosis, because all you're doing there is bypassing the critical thought process, but then the therapeutic end of it is different than psychotherapy or, or psychological counseling in that the, the critical analytical conscious mind processes and filters information that passes through it. So if, in other words, I say something to you and I'm not quite clear on what I say, your critical thought process can say, oh, I know what that person means. The subconscious mind can't do that. The subconscious mind either says, I like that idea, I'll do it, or I don't like that idea, I won't. So... Hypnotherapy, number one, is more brief therapy than, than most of your counseling forms of therapy. And number two, the, it, 
is more direct and to the point. If someone comes in my office and they say, well, geez, I don't know what's the matter with me. I don't know what my goals really are. You know, I hate the world. I want to eat worms. I hate my life. You know, th then they, they probably need to do some counseling, some psychotherapy or psychoanalysis or whatever, cognitive therapy, some, some type of counseling to get a, a target in mind of what they want to accomplish. But if someone comes in and says, you know, I have this fear of, of flying in airplanes, or I have this anxiety over X, Y, or Z, then we have a specific thing to work with, and we can get to the core of that much more quickly with hypnosis. So I would say the biggest difference is hypnosis is at its best when you have a specific target that you're looking to modify perception or behavior. And psychotherapy, psychological counseling, and so forth is less in intense but broader in scope. So that, that would be my, my view on that in any respect. What is the difference between hypnosis, hypnotherapy, guided imagery, meditation, visualization, and relaxation techniques? I think, if, again, I, I don't want to sound redundant, but if we go back to what I said early, earlier, that I'm not even particularly thrilled. I think the term hypnosis tends to be a bit ar archaic. They're all, the meditation and hypnosis are both forms of critical faculty bypass. The difference between hypnosis and hypnotherapy is that you can have hypnosis without doing therapy. And in meditation, in meditation, you're more freeform. You're accessing that same critical faculty bypass or that same trance state, but you can't direct it. Be, I, I had uh, one time I did a talk for, for a group who wanted me to speak on self-hypnosis, and I said, I don't believe in self-hypnosis. And they said, well, talk about that. And I truly don't believe that self When people say they're doing self-hypnosis, they're usually doing affirmations or they're meditating. And the reason is simply this, that once you access trance state, if you bring in critical thought, then you're going to diminish the depth of trance. So if you allow yourself, all hypnosis is self-hypnosis to the extent that the person has to allow it. But you, if you allow yourself to go into hypnosis or trance state, and then you try to formulate suggestions. To formulate suggestions, you need to use critical thoughts. So you use the critical thought to say, I'll be more confident, I'm, I'm a non-smoker, whatever it might be. That critical thought will deteriorate the depth of trance. So this is kind of a roundabout answer to the question, but uh, I don't think there's any significant di difference in the trance state. I think the difference is in the application, what we're doing in the application. Does hypnosis have a scientific basis? Absolutely. Hypnosis, anything, I think, whether it's surgery or hypnosis or, or painting or, or music, has both a scientific and artistic side. But I, I think to date the biggest problem in the hypnotherapy community, and one of the things that's kept us, uh, slowed us anyway from becoming mainstream, is too often it's approached as uh, an art or a mystical, something mystical, when really it is a science. And the one thing that I teach my students in our classes at, at Bucks College is, is that if you have a protocol that you're following, and you have a sound protocol that part A does this, part A, this is, part B, this is the function, part C, this is the function, and you know how to integrate all of this and, and get the best approach through that science, you can do consistently good therapy. Uh, I had a, a woman not too long ago said to me, well, I'm an intuitive hypnotherapist, and I didn't say anything to her, but I thought to myself, what the heck is that? I mean, we all have intu intuition, and it's okay to use your intuition to whatever extent, but you may be, your intuition may be on target one day, it may be off target another day. If you have a sound scientific protocol, you can just be getting over the flu where you're not at the top of your game, and you can walk into your office and do consistently good therapy because you're following a consistently sound 
protocol. So yeah, I, it definitely is a science. And if people understand what the depths of hypnosis represent, what critical thought is, what the conscious and subconscious mind represent, and so forth, if you have that solid foundation and you apply that science, you'll get consistently good results. Does hypnosis have a biological basis? Yeah, I, I think everything that we are, we're, we're a product of our psychological makeup, our emotional makeup, our physical makeup, our, our biochemical makeup. And that's one advantage that we have at our office with, with Marie and I. Uh, being she's an MD and a psychiatrist, and I do counseling and psychotherapy and hypnotherapy in the office, and we have this nice balance. Uh, if someone does require meds or, or some type of, of medical treatment or testing or evaluation or neurological testing, we have the ability to do all that because, yeah, it's all, it's all one package. It, it's kind of like the yin and yang. People will say, oh, that represents male and female, and light and dark, and positive and negative. It doesn't. The yin and yang represents two properties of the same entity in constant motion, one always transforming in balance with the other. It's a, a moving, it, it's, it's an energetic symbol. It's not a sedentary symbol. Well, mind, body, and spirit are the same thing. We like to label things, but the fact of the matter is, you're a product of all of those. So I don't think anything can be treated independently. If someone comes in and I suspect that maybe the person, let's say, is, is bipolar, then I'll refer them to Marie so she can handle the psychi psychiatric end of it. And if the person requires meds, then yeah, it may be a biological issue and not, not simply an emotional issue. And I, I think too often we become one dimensional in our thought process. And in doing that, we don't do justice to the client or patient. So all of those things have to be considered. What if any changes in the way hypnosis is practiced do you foresee in the next 10 or 20 years? What I would like to see is a higher level of education initially. And I think some behavioral science background is important to have. Uh, I think ethics, we've incorporated ethics training into our program as well. The next sem semester, we're going to be incorporating a module on behavioral sciences. It's not to train people to be a psychologist or a psychotherapist, but to give them at least basic knowledge and the ability to communicate with other people in the mental health field. I think knowing what just basic and fundamental medications people that you're going to encounter, people that come into you for any type of therapy, a good percentage of them are going to be on some type of meds for issues that they're having, knowing how that might affect your session, not necessarily uh, knowing what the meds are for or how they're, but if a med makes someone sleepy or if it makes them anxious, or you need to know that so you know when those signals come up during the session that they may be a result of the meds. So there, there's the educational level I would definitely like to see increase. Uh, hopefully it will because we're never going to become truly mainstream unless it does. And as I said before, if you're going to be a hairdresser in Pennsylvania, where I'm from anyway, you, you have to have 1,500 hours of training. I, I, th I think certainly we're doing something that should have at least that amount of training, if not more. And we're moving in the right direction, but we're certainly moving at a snail's pace. And I understand that it's, uh, there's financial considerations and there's uh, time restraints and, and uh, you know, moving, at least we're, we're moving in that direction. But boy, I'd like to see that happen a lot faster. I think it would increase the level of professionalism because we have some really wonderful people in the field of hypnotherapy and like any profession, it could be physicians, lawyers, accountants, whatever. We've also got people that really have done the bare bones training and they're out practicing. And that's the people that, that kind of tend to give us a little bit of a tarnish on our reputation. Uh, so I, I think that's incredibly important that we consider that. I'm not a big advocate of government intervention and licensing because when you do that, it's, it's 
Kind of like if, if you have a, a feud in your house and you call the police, you just let the police into your family business, and that's not going to be good for anyone involved. Well, the same thing when you invite people in from the bureaucracy that knows nothing about our science, then it's going to create as many problems, if not more, than it, it solves. But that being said, if we don't police ourselves and if we don't create some good standards and if we don't come together in the hypnotherapy community and work together instead of having all these little fiefdoms where, where people are, are fighting turf wars, then the government is going to step in. And, and so we, we have a choice. We can either do it ourselves and have a good outcome or we can wait until the boom falls and we're all saying, oh, why didn't we do something before this happened? So that's where I'd like to see it go. Where it will go, I don't know. What is the difference, if any, between a hypnotist and a very charismatic, persuasive person? Well, if you say between a hypnotist and a very charismatic individual, that's different than saying a hypnotherapist and a very charismatic individual. Um, some people are inducing hypnosis and not even realizing they're doing it. So they, in fact, are doing things similar to a hypnotist, but the difference would be they're not using a formal induction. Uh, but nevertheless, if you look at faith healers, on, you see a faith healer on TV or something, I don't know if they're trained and know that they're doing hypnosis or if it's just part of the procedure that they use. But the fact is, if you look at what it takes for good hyp hypnosis to take place, if you have uh, rapport, expectation, enhancement of the imagination, all of these fundamentals that we need for hypnosis, uh, and you look at what an induction is, how do you get critical thought? How do you bypass critical thought? You can bore it out of the way, you can confuse it out of the way, or you can shock it out of the way. So if you look at a faith healer, they create expectation. I was just uh, saying this at a class earlier today. Uh, Mary Smith will be watching her favorite televangelist faith healer, and she'll send a donation. Then they send her back a card saying, please tell us about yourself so we can pray for you. The rapport is established. She sends it back in. They send her another postcard. Come to this revival and you will be healed. Okay, now we've created expectation. She goes to the revival and they say, it was Mary Smith in the audience. Well, they know she is. How the two ushers get right next to her? It's a miracle. So the ushers bring her down. The crowd is cheering. If you've ever been in a crowded airport or train station and you trance out you go, from all the confusion, Confusion and hypnosis, as you know, isn't trickery, it's sensory overload. So the Mary Smith comes down to stage, the people are singing, the lights are flashing, the guy's up there uh, chanting and singing, and the Lord is going to save you, come on up as she comes up. She's already going into trance through confusion, and um, uh, the expectation and all of that is already created. She comes up, what's the guy do? Hits her in the head, shock, she falls backward, more confusion through vertigo, and he makes a suggestion, you are healed. How's that different from therapeutic? He's doing rapid induction hypnosis with pain management suggestion. So yeah, there are people out there that are charismatic that are doing hypnosis. I think the difference with a hypnotherapist, at least we hope that this is the case, that the hypnotherapist has the training to know how to specifically target certain therapies in a responsible way uh, and be able to guide their client or patient from point A to point B effectively. So I think there's a much bigger difference between a hypnotherapist and a charismatic person than there is a hypnotist and a charismatic person. What, if anything, is standing in the way of hypnosis becoming more mainstream? I think that the, the public has to have confidence that there's some type of consistency across the board that when they call for a hypnotherapist, they're actually getting a trained therapist. And the biggest thing really is the educational foundation. We want people out there that are representing our profession 
in a responsible, professional way that when, when a client or patient asks the person a question, they can give them a, a rational, reasonable answer because they have the training background to do it. The, the other thing that I think is really important, in our course, we have a practicum at the end of the, the course where graduating students have to work with volunteers from the general population under my supervision so that they're actually doing hypnotherapy before they go out in the field. And then we give them a year of free consultations with our office so that in that first critical year, if they're having any type of issues or something, they have, let's say they have a client come in, they just aren't getting the results they want, they can call me and, and uh, consult with me and I'll help them walk through the different stages and find out why they're not getting the results that they're looking for. And, and I think that type of mentoring in all of our programs, uh, the educational foundation, are all so important because until now, you can have a person call, and I've had, the, I've had people come into my office and they'd say, I went to another hypnotherapist and you know, they didn't do any of this stuff that you're doing with me. They didn't do an intake and they didn't explain things to me. And, and I think that's what holds us back. You have, if the person is lucky enough to get someone who really takes the, the science and the profession of hypnosis seriously, then they're gonna then they're gonna walk out of there going, wow, this is really cool. I, I I would recommend a hypnotherapist to anybody. But if they go to someone that really hasn't done their homework, then the opposite is gonna occur. And I think that's what's held us back for the most part. Word of mouth is is the best advertising, good or bad. Dr. David Cheek stated that we can do more harm with ignorance of hypnotism than we could ever do by using hypnosis and suggestion constructively. What is your take on that statement? I don't know. I really don't know his premise for that or how he came to that conclusion. But I certainly would not agree with that premise uh, to begin with. And I'm not saying that, that in certain situations a very skilled practitioner could enable, could, could create a situation intentionally that could be harmful in some way. Uh, but let's not take the exception. Let's look at the general rule. And if we look at the general rule, your subconscious mind is your protector. It won't let anything bad happen to you. And it only takes suggestions in general that it finds productive or positive to that person. So if that's the case, look at something as simple as this. And, and this is something that hypnotherapists and hypnotists don't even think of as hypnosis until I bring it up to them. If you're walking down the sidewalk and there's an uneven pavement and you trip over the sidewalk, you have shock and confusion, you're falling, you have the vertigo, for a moment you go into hypnosis because your leg shoots forward, you don't have time to say, oh, gravity sucks, I'm falling. You just, your leg just flings out. That's not a reflex. A reflex would be if you're on the edge of your physician's treatment table and they hit the nerve in your knee with the mallet and your leg flings up, that's a reaction from a nerve. When you trip and you're falling, your critical mind doesn't have time to process that, so it bails and turns it over to your subconscious mind. Your leg goes out and you catch yourself and you keep yourself from falling. Momentarily, you are in hypnosis through shock and confusion. So if the subconscious mind is our protector, in general, with Rare exceptions, you can't bring harm to somebody with hypnosis. For the most part, what's going to happen is you're going to either get the result you want or nothing's going to happen. Now, in the hands of someone who is really, really skilled, who has maybe some diabolical nature, could they create situations that could bring harm to someone if they did it intentionally? Probably, yeah. But that's not the general rules. So you, you can say that in any profession. It could be law, it could be accounting, it, it could be plumbing, it could be carpentry. Could somebody do something diabolical that would bring harm to somebody if they wanted to? Of course. But it's not the general rule. So you can't throw all carpenters under the bus because one might cut somebody with a saw or hit them with a hammer. And you can't say, well, hypnosis is dangerous. Uh, Ignorant people who are ignorant of the science of hypnosis that are trying to do it aren't going to be in business long. So they'll weed themselves out and they're not going to do any harm in the meantime, likely. 
Freud is said to have debunked hypnosis, yet he is quoted as saying, everything that has ever been said and written about the great dangers of hypnosis belongs to the realm of fable. Did he change his mind? Uh, it, it's been many, many years since I've studied Freudian hypnosis. So, uh, the only thing that I could say to that is people change their political views, they, they change their personal views, and, you know, and it, perhaps as years went by, and, and I, I know today, I look at some of my educational DVDs from back in, the, in 1996, 1998, and I look at the things I do today, and I've grown and I've learned, and I hope that in life you're either moving forward or backward. There is no standing still. So I've chosen to move forward, and 10 years from now, I'm going to be a much better hypnotherapist than I am today. So as Freud went through his evolution, or as anyone else does, yeah, they're likely to change their, their viewpoint. I'm just surmising because, like I said, it's been many years since I've been in college studying Freudian psychology, but uh, that, that would be my assumption. Scottish psychiatrist Ronald David Lang was quoted as saying, We are all in a post-hypnotic trance induced in early infancy. Can you elaborate on that? Well, I, I wouldn't elaborate on it, but I don't know again that I agree with the premise. It, it all depends. Do we all go in and out of hypnosis in our daily lives? Every person of av average or uh, above intelligence goes into hypnosis about a dozen times a week. They just don't think of it as hypnosis. I think children spend a lot more time in hypnosis than adults do because their critical thought process isn't locked in yet. So children, yeah, I would say children spend a, a lot of time in trance state. In fact, I think Every creative person who's ever graced the face of the earth, I don't care if it's Albert Einstein, Albert Einstein said something to the effect of that he got most of his great ideas in his quiet time. And if you go on to read what his quiet time was, he was meditating. Uh, if you look at the Wright brothers, the Wright brothers had a dream of flight. Think about this. You're the Wright brothers' neighbor. And... You're saying, oh, Orville and Wilbur, they say they're going to fly. Oh, they're tipping the bottle a little too much, right? Birds fly. People don't fly. So they had a dream. They could see this flight in their mind's eye before they ever built the first airplane. So, yeah, they, they were able to dream this, which would take critical faculty bypass. I believe that all original thought comes from the subconscious mind. The conscious mind can only regurgitate what we already know. It's, it's a computer. It's analytical. It's rational. It's critical. It is incapable of generating original thought. The subconscious mind is where all original thought comes from. This is why kids they go out and play and they imagine friends and they imagine a, wonder, a cardboard box as a wonderful race car or palace or whatever it might be. So... I would disagree with the premise that we spend our lives in hypnosis, but I think throughout our lives, hypnosis certainly plays a significant role. Some prominent hypnotists believe that a person can be hypnotized to be an assassin, a Manchurian candidate, as in the case of Sirhan Sirhan, who was alleged to have killed Robert F. Kennedy. Do you believe it's possible? First, let me start the, the answer to that question in this respect. From an ethical standpoint, it would be irresponsible of me to comment clinically on, on whether Saran Saran was in hypnosis because I haven't seen the data. So I have no way to know. So uh, ethically, that would not be responsible of me to comment on. However, if I, if I were to generalize that, I, I would say that in the realm of possibility, for example, if you combine hypnosis with, with pharmaceuticals and with sensory deprivation and different types of things that could alter a person's mental state, is it possible with that combined effort to create a situation like that? In theory, it's possible. But on the other hand, <clears throat> with hypnosis in general, we can't be made to do anything that we don't want to do. So, for example, if you see on, uh, on a movie, somebody's hypnotized, and that's where people get these wacky ideas. Someone's hypnotized, and they say, when you hear a phone ring, you're going to go to the nearest bank and rob the bank. 
Well, it's not going to happen unless, the caveat is, unless the person is already a bank robber and predisposed to robbing banks. Because if it's something they would do anyway in a conscious waking state, then could they be encouraged through suggestion to do that on a certain cue in hypnosis? Probably so. So I, I don't know that, that I would say, in a, that would be a stretch to say that Sirhan Sirhan was murdered Kennedy while he was in trance. Is it theoretically possible? Sure. Forensic hypnosis has been involved in some high-profile murder cases. Since the self is self-preserving, is it possible to get the exact truth from a hypnotized defendant or plaintiff? The subconscious mind does not have the ability to fabricate. It can react to a leading question or statement. This is why forensic dialogue, understanding forensic dialogue is so important in doing an intake and, and, and providing suggestion. For example, if you saw a crime in the parking lot of the Hilton Hotel on May 10th of last year, and the police wanted me to help you to, with memory enhancement to recall those events, and I do a regression with you, and I, I count you back from 10 to 1 at the count of 1, you'll be at the moment, and you'll be at the, in the parking lot of the Hilton, it'll be May 5th, and so on and so forth. I can say that because I know that to be factually true. So I get down to number one. I say, where are you, inside or out? And you say, I'm outside. I say, you alone? Are you with someone? I'm alone. Is it day or is it night? It's night. Um, and move through those innocuous questions to kind of get you in the groove. Uh, describe your surroundings. I'm in the parking lot. How many cars are in the parking lot? Eh, no good. Because the idea of cars didn't come from you. It came from me. If I say to you, describe your surroundings and you say I'm in the parking lot and I say give me more detail and you say there's cars in the parking lot and I say tell me how many cars you see then it was done forensically so the key is if if a person even unintentionally creates an idea rather than eliciting the response from the person yeah false memory can be created pretty easily and that's why I think in a lot of cases the courts won't accept uh, testimony under hypnosis. In some states uh, it can be used as a tool, but it can't be used in court and has to be filmed from point A to, to the person walks out of the room. So the bottom line to that is that, that a person can have a false memory if even the slightest implication of something leads them to have that false memory. Some hypnotists have said that it doesn't matter whether or not a client experiences a true past life. It's not about truth, it's about perception. All that matters is that there is a healing. What is your take on that? Yeah, uh, I think the truth is always more powerful and if you, if in regression the therapy is done forensically, then the more factual, the more powerful, because you're getting to that underlying problem. You're not getting to some facade or some false idea of what the problem was. I think if you have um, some false perception or you create a false memory through improper dialogue, you may get some temporary results. You really may, because the person may buy into it for a while. But what you didn't change, you didn't change the real underlying issue. If you don't address that real underlying issue, at some point in time, it's going to resurface. It's no different than in psychological counseling or something where somebody represses something and, and maybe they're able to push it to the backs, back room of their mind for a while, but something will trigger it at some point in time in their life and it'll come out with a vengeance because they've never addressed it. I'm working with, with a patient at our office with that right now where there has been so much repressed due to family situations that when it finally came out, the duty hit the fan. And with regression, it's no different. If, if you're not addressing the real issues, everything you're doing, you're working under a false premise. So, no, I, w I would disagree with that, that, that it's, it's okay to create a false scenario. But the, the, 
The only thing that I would say in respect to that, it's almost the same wording, but it, a totally different context. If the therapist does not accept the idea of past lives, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not true. If somebody doesn't believe in God, it doesn't mean that there's no God. It just means they don't believe in it. So I would say to that therapist, go ahead and go with it. You may help your client. It's been said that mass hypnosis is not recognized by the general public because the general public is hypnotized so often that they're no longer aware of it. What is your response to that statement? Look at the movies that we go to see. What do they call it in show business? A suspended state of disbelief. Which is really not significantly different than when you're talking about mass hypnosis. But I think mass hypnosis, there's something, something more to it. I, I think basically, and this is going to sound derogatory, but I certainly don't mean it to be, that people basically are, are herd animals. If that were not true, then why would when one person buys a Furby, everybody's got to buy a Furby. When one person gets a Tickle Me Elmo, everybody's got to get a Tickle Me Elmo, and then they end up in, in the closet for two, three years, and they end up in the yard sale. But if they have theirs, you got to have yours. That's just human nature for the most part. Again, there's exceptions to every rule. So I don't think mass hypnosis is, can be viewed in a vacuum. I think you've also got the basic human nature, that herd mentality involved. So if you put the two of those things together, then in the right hands, if you have somebody who's a tremendously influential, charismatic speaker who knows how to use tools of critical faculty bypass, can those things come together to create the perfect storm? Yeah, yeah, they certainly can. But, but again, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. Is there anything else that you would like to add to this discussion? The, o the only thing that I'd like to say in closing is, is that we all have a responsi responsibility to ourselves and our offices and our families and so on and so forth, but we also have a tremendous responsibility to the profession. And I think when people go to their office each and every day, they, they need to be aware of that. They need to, to have... Uh, in the back of their mind and some place of, of importance always has to be that idea of how am I representing my profession. And I think too often people don't do that. I know when, I, when I'm working with patients at our office, that's always first on my mind. What's, what's in the best interest of the patient and how can I do a better job today than I did yesterday? And I think that's really important and people should, should keep that in mind every day when they walk through the door.